Egypt is home to many secrets and many legends. The mysteries of the Great Sphinx have long baffled and delighted Egyptologists and high school history buffs alike. This iconic Egyptian limestone structure depicts a mythical reclining sphinx and is Egypt's oldest known monumental sculpture. There are other sphinxes out there, many of which have yet to be discovered, but most of them are small in scale compared to the Great Sphinx of Giza, built around the same time as the Great Pyramid about 4,500 years ago. There are some secret tunnels and chambers rumored to still be discovered under the sphinx. What mysteries might they hold? Watch through until the end of this video. The final secret is going to blow you away. And if you enjoy this video, be sure to like this video, leave a comment on it, and subscribe to the channel. Secret Tunnels and Secret Chambers Found Under the Sphinx of Egypt there are supposedly some secret tunnels and chambers housed beneath the Great Sphinx of Giza, and only a few have been discovered. Independent Egyptologist John Anthony West led a series of expeditions between 1991 and 1993. It was asserted that the Sphinx was carved near the end of the last ice age when heavy rains beat down on the Sahara, which dramatically differs from the generalized assumption that the statue was carved about 4,500 years ago. West and his crew thought that a lost civilization built the Sphinx, but they were quite literally evicted from the site by the Egyptian government's chief inspector of antiquities for the pyramids and sphinx, Dr. Zahi Hawass. Hawass was angered by the NBC television film about the team's expedition. The production asserted that a hall of records housed beneath the sphinx paws could link the site to the lost city of Atlantis. Hawass called these claims American hallucinations and deemed the expeditions unscientific. The film had been sponsored by the Virginia Beach-based Association for Research and Enlightenment (ARE), an association whose mission is to explore the revelations of American psychic Edgar Cayce. Prior to his death in 1947, Cayce claimed that the Sphinx had been built in 10,500 BC and had a secret hall of records buried beneath it where the Atlanteans stored the history of their long-since lost society. Perhaps a little to Dr. Hawass's detriment, secret tunnels were in fact found below the Sphinx and around the pyramids, which Hawass announced to the public in April of 1996. A pair of Sphinx found in Luxor the Great Sphinx of Giza is not the only Sphinx to be found in Egypt. In fact, a pair of smaller Sphinxes were found in Luxor. The Luxor Temple was a ceremonial site specifically used during the annual Opet Festival in which the statues of Amon, Mut, Kunsu, found on the Avenue of Sphinxes, were toted all the way from the Karnak and reunited in the temple's sacred space. In the temple, the Avenue of Sphinx houses 700 Sphinxes carved from sandstone. But recently, two more statues were discovered in a nearby temple in Luxor by the Colossi of Mennon and Amahotep III Temple Conservation Project. These large sphinxes each measure 26 feet long and were discovered partially submerged in water at a temple erected for Amahotep III, King Tutankhamun's grandfather, a pharaoh who ruled Egypt between 390 BC and 1353 BC. A combined team of German and Egyptian researchers were investigating the Temple of Millions of Years when they found the artifacts located close to a processional road used during Amenhotep III's lifetime for celebrations and ceremonies. The pair of limestone sphinxes depict Amenhotep wearing a large necklace and mongoose headdress. An inscription on his chest reads, The Beloved of the God Amun-Ra, which was Amenhotep's royal name. Discovery of the Theban Necropolis Sphinx-like Face Another rather unique Sphinx-related discovery was made in 2022, that of a massive face that had been carved into the side of a mountain near the Theban Necropolis. The significance of this discovery is the resemblance it bears to the Great Sphinx in Giza. The Theban Necropolis itself is home to quite a few hidden secrets, including some 40 mummies, with Ramses II, Seti I, and Thutmose III numbered among them. Guarding these mummies is the recently discovered mountainside carving. It appears to show the face of someone wearing a wig, looking similar to the goddess Hathor, daughter of the sun god Ra. While there is no body of an animal present, professor and Egyptologist Jose Ramon Perez Aquino says it could very well serve as a protective figure, much like the Great Sphinx. Unfortunately, it seems as though the face in the mountain was purposely vandalized sometime in the Middle Ages as the area was being massively Christianized and temples turned into monasteries. What is so special about this statue is that it quite literally lights up during the spring solstice, indicating that it served a spiritual purpose. What that purpose is, though, one can only guess. A History of the Great Sphinx of Giza 
The Great Sphinx of Giza sets the tone for all other sphinxes in Egypt, but it also holds so many secrets, but it holds so many secrets buried within its unique limestone structure. With a human head, possibly in the likeness of Pharaoh Khafre, placed atop a laying lion's body, the Great Sphinx was probably built around 2558 to 2532 BC, although, of course, that is still up for debate. Still, it is one of the world's oldest and biggest monolithic statues. Back when it was built, Egyptians didn't have any bronze or iron tools. They probably used stone hammers and copper chisels, which would have been used for detailing. The Great Sphinx was likely supposed to be part of an even bigger temple complex, but Khafre's vision for the temple never came to fruition. An excavation in 1978 found three stone blocks in the quarry excavation, which suggests that laborers abandoned them as they were dragging them to the Sphinx temple complex. The northern edge of the ditch near the Sphinx had sections of bedrock that were only partly quarried. Along with a toolkit and workmen's lunch, it seems as though the workers simply walked off the job. Why did the workers ditch their jobs? No one knows for sure. What Egyptologists do know is that no name of a priest or priestess was attached to the temple and that the temple was never used. All that is left of the temple is its eroded limestone foundations. Considering that historians do not even know for sure that it was Khafre who commissioned this massive undertaking in his likeness, we may never find any historical texts or hieroglyphs that tell us why the temple was left unfinished. It was once buried in sand. The Great Sphinx was once buried in sand up to its neck, which lasted for about 700 years until Thutmose started renovations on the structure. In fact, it is believed that he was the first to have any repair work done on the Great Sphinx. The structure became a tourist attraction, with ancient Greeks and Romans flocking to it, taking in its wonder. Some Roman emperors, out of pure curiosity, visited the Sphinx. What's more, it was the Romans who began clearing away all the sand that had piled up over the years. After the Romans began clearing away the sand in the first century AD, they built a monumental stairway leading up to the Sphinx's giant paws. The Romans also erected a podium for viewing the Sphinx at the top of those stairs. That podium stood until 1931, when excavations at the site dismantled it. The nose broke off between the 3rd and 10th centuries AD, and no one knows why. What you see of the Sphinx today is a partial restoration using limestone layered blocks. Quite clearly, the head and face show a lot of wear and tear from centuries of both exposure to the elements and vandalism. The nose, it is said, broke off sometime between the 3rd and 10th centuries AD. A 15th century Egyptian Arab historian named al marzarki asserted that the nose's destruction came at the hands of a Sufi Muslim fanatic called Muhammad Sayyam al-Dar. In 1378, he attacked the Sphinx with a crowbar type of tool after becoming enraged that the Egyptian peasantry were still praying to the Great Sphinx, which he believed was a representation of the god Abu Hol. The peasants hoped that Abu Hol would give them abundant crops, as they were being threatened by the increasingly sprawling desert sands. They burned offerings in front of the monument in order to appease the god. In his fit of rage, Siam al dahar on a solo quest, apparently, pried the nose loose and also damaged some of the blocks in the air areas. Of course, this didn't sit well with the peasants who worshipped the monument as a god and gained a bit of tourist income. They were so mad that they actually lynched Siam al dahar and buried him in front of the Sphinx as an offering to Abu Hol. Unfortunately for them, that did not help them with their crops, and the desert sands overtook Giza. At least, that is the most official version of events on file. Whether one holy man managed to destroy so much of the Sphinx's face on his own is still up for debate. The Osiris Shaft in his expeditions to Giza, Dr. Zari Hawass and his team of researchers explored what he calls the Osiris Shaft, located about halfway between Khafre's funerary temple and the Great Sphinx. It can be accessed through a shaft known as Shaft A, and it consists of three vertical shafts that lead to three different levels. Level 2 and 3 were found to house even more chambers. Dr. Hawass asserted that this underground complex was one and the same as that described by the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, who, in the 5th century BC, visited the Great Sphinx of Giza and saw the Osiris shaft. Herodotus thought that the tomb belonged to Khufu, second pharaoh of the 4th dynasty and father of Khafre. Herodotus probably never entered the shaft, so his description of it is lacking in detail. He probably gained his information from local tour guides. Potsherds from the 6th dynasty, found in Shaft C, were the first artifacts uncovered from the Osiris shaft. This led Dr. Hawass to conclude the shaft was probably built around that time. Chambers in level 2 of Shaft C were probably added later on, in the late period, which was when Giza started receiving more attention again. 
All in all, Dr. Hawass felt that this was a dummy tomb for Osiris, the Egyptian god of the dead. He came to this conclusion because the mythology surrounding Osiris came to a climax in the Old Kingdom, and the construction of the shaft complex in the Sixth Dynasty, therefore, makes sense with the rise of the Osirian cult. These Egyptians were essentially digging downward into the underworld, the realm of Osiris. Texts from the New Kingdom support this theory, as does the fact that the sarcophagus found in Chamber 1 is surrounded by four pillars and water. Osiris's underworld realm is immersed in water. Interestingly enough, the Giza Plateau was known as the House of Osiris, Lord of Rostow, in the New Kingdom. Osiris would have been symbolically buried inside of the shaft so as to provide kings buried in nearby temples power. Also, a cemetery for Osiris is located nearby, dating from the Topotomac and Roman periods. The New Kingdom found merit in the Osiris shaft as Osiris's cult gained traction, but there are still secrets buried within its various chambers and shafts, and each one of these areas around the Sphinx is utterly unique. Perings Hole One of the Great Sphinx's known hidden chambers is called Perings Hole. This hole is the Sphinx's back, approximately four feet in back of the head. It was constructed in 1840 by Howard Wies and was dubbed Perings Hole in order of the man who engineered it. Wies had this hole made because he believed that he could access secret chambers inside of the Great Sphinx by devising this hole. It was supposed to measure in at 27 feet in depth, but the drill rod got jammed. Vis attempted to use gunpowder to get the drill rod out, but he gave up on that since he did not want to cause any further damage to this monolithic structure. In 1978, Dr. Zahi Hawass cleared the hole created by Vice. When he ventured inside, he discovered part of the Great Sphinx's headdress, an unexpected and riveting find indeed. The Eastern Shaft Located within the Great Sphinx's paws is a trap door forged from iron. Just look into the middle of the Sphinx's chest and the Thutmose IV Dream Stell. This actually is not a passageway, rather it is a rectangular pit below the door was covered with a roof made from cement, which was then sealed off with this trap door. This was done by French Egyptologist Emile Barres. He was tasked with restoring the structure back in the 1920s and did this in order to help preserve the Great Sphinx. Shaft A Another pathway paved by Bariz is Shaft A. Shaft A is a deep hole paved in cement right atop the Great Sphinx's head. This hole measures in at about 5 feet square and has a depth of nearly 6 feet. Again, a trap door forged from iron was fixed to the opening of the hole. There is some speculation that the hole was started as a way to attach an Egyptian headdress onto the Great Sphinx, similar to what was achieved in the New Kingdom, but later it was supposedly deepened in order to search for hidden chambers inside the monolith. Shaft C Another shaft, known as Shaft C, can be found along the backside of the Great Sphinx. If you go down this square shaft, you will find yourself at a dead end. It measures in at 1.58 meters and is 2.4 meters wide. There is a depth of 3.2 meters and it is located at 0.4 meters to the northwest of the exit from the second shaft. In his excavation of the shaft, Dr. Hawass discovered that the chamber floor was excavated from the south side. Inside this chamber, Dr. Hawass and his team found an anthropoid sarcophagus of granite. It had been set into the pit that had been carved into the chamber floor. The sarcophagus the team found measures in at 210 centimeters long, 50 centimeters wide, and 45 centimeters deep. Inside of it were the badly decomposed remains of a human skeleton, accompanied by a slew of pottery shards and shabits that dated from the 26th dynasty, from 664 to 525 BC, and also known as the Sa'it period. The sarcophagus's shape itself also places its date within the 26th dynasty. Shaft D Dr. Hawass and fellow Egyptologist Mark Lerner opened a passage in their 1980 expedition, which they referred to as Shaft D. This shaft is located in the northwest hind part of the Great Sphinx on the floor. This shaft has been discovered previously by a boy named Muhammad Abu Mawag Fayed. He had been helping Emil Berez in 1926 with clearing this area out. This shaft drops down to the water table that exists below the Sphinx. Part of this unique passageway winds down around the Sphinx and ends in a dead-end stop approximately 4.5 meters below the level of the floor. In the 1980-81 expedition, it was discovered that Shaft D's lower portion in fact extended all the way to the water table. Above this area, the explorers found a bunch of more modern items such as glass, tinfoil, and cement. The sides of this passageway are not straight and have a crude cut to them. Oddly though, there are footholds on the sides of the wall that allow people to walk over. It seems to be more of an exploratory shaft than anything else. The Keyhole Shaft 
Another oddly designed chamber is the keyhole shaft. It is part of shaft D in the Sphinx's enclosure, but not actually connected to the Sphinx itself. Known as the keyhole shaft, it is located on the floor of the shaft D enclosure beneath the wall's northernmost ledge. This puts it right behind the Sphinx's northern hind paw. The keyhole shaft is approximately 4.5 feet by 3.5 feet and is slightly over 6 feet deep. Inside of the shaft, explorers discovered a massive piece of basalt that had just one smooth, finished side to it. There are theories that this shaft was meant to serve as a tomb that had never quite been finished. A Rumored Hall of Records one of the biggest mysteries surrounding the Great Sphinx of Giza is the Hall of Records. Psychic Edgar Cayce once prophesied that a Hall of Records belonging to the lost city of Atlantis's people could be found within the Sphinx. Given Cayce's rampant popularity and notoriety for his accuracy, some people started to wonder if he was right. As already mentioned, there was an NBC-linked expedition that got kicked out of the tunnels and chambers by Dr. Hawass in 1993. John West and his team were having a documentary TV film made about their expedition, and there was an assertion being made that the Sphinx was much older than already reported. That seemingly set Dr. Hawass off, which prompted him to expel the team. One thing that West and his team theorized on was the existence of the Hall of Records left by the Atlanteans. This film posited that the Hall of Records was located somewhere in one of the Sphinx's paws, but Hawass dismissed these claims as American hallucinations. However, just a few years later, in 1996, Dr. Hawass had to admit that there were unknown chambers located beneath the Great Sphinx and that they probably held within them many secrets yet to be revealed. Author Graham Hancock gave a book tour in 1996 in which he detailed his discovery that the heavens aligned perfectly with the Giza Plateau in 10,500 BC, which would have made the rumored Hall of Records a truly sacred space for an ancient civilization predating the Egyptians. Hancock often counteracts orthodox Egyptologists, claiming that the Great Sphinx is actually a representation of Khafre due to hieroglyphic inscription in a single letter of Khafre's name on the stone tablet that sits in the front of the Sphinx. Egyptologists added in the second syllable into the translation without truly knowing its meaning. To quote Hancock, Egypt Egyptologists find facts to fit their theories when they should be making theories based on the facts. Perhaps that is why we know so little about the Great Sphinx and its significance as part of the Giza Plateau and, more broadly, of ancient Egyptian culture. The Old Kingdom Cemetery that houses the bones of laborers and overseers Another interesting discovery related to the Great Sphinx of Giza is that there is an Old Kingdom cemetery nearby that houses the bones of overseers and laborers who worked on the monolithic structure. It wasn't until 1990 that this cemetery was discovered, and it happened very haphazardly. A female American tourist was riding her horse when she was suddenly bucked off about half a mile due south of the Sphinx. A low-sitting mud brick wall was exposed and is what had started the horse after it stumbled into the wall. Dr. Hawass was sent to investigate this Old Kingdom cemetery cemetery and found 600 people buried there. Overseers were entombed and identified by their names and titles inscribed on their tombs. Around them were the less ornate tombs of the laborers. About nine years after this discovery, Dr. Hawass and Mark Lerner found a lost city close to the cemetery. After excavation started, they realized this settlement dated to Khafre's reign and was larger than 10 football fields. Four clusters of eight lengthy mud brick barracks stood at the center of this lost city, resembling something like a modern house. There were sleeping platforms a kitchen, and a pillared porch. About 50 people could sleep side by side there. If there were two or more levels, over 2,000 workers could have possibly been housed there. Young male cattle, in other words, some real prime beef, remains were found at the site, indicating that the laborers were probably men who were above slave status. The laborers likely had some status, even if it was not very high up on the social ladder. Viewing the sun during spring and fall equinoxes one of the other things that Lerner discovered during his excavations of the Great Sphinx of Giza was that a dynamic astronomical event occurs at the Great Sphinx if you stand there on either the spring or fall equinox. If you stand inside of the eastern portion during sunset, you will see the sun apparently sinking right into the shoulders of the Sphinx, and just beyond that, it also seemingly sinks into the back part of Khafre's pyramid. The shadows of the Sphinx and the pyramid simultaneously converge as symbols of the king. This is why Lerner theorizes that that the Sphinx represents the Pharaoh bringing offerings to the sun god Ra to the temple's court. This could represent Khafre as Horus, the falcon god, giving offerings to his father Ra, which symbolizes Khafre's father Khufu as an incarnation of Ra. 
Also, when you stand at the Sphinx during the summer solstice, the sun appears to set right in between the silhouettes casted by the pyramids of Khufu and Khafre. The scene itself resembles the hieroglyph Akhet, which translates to horizon. This could also symbolize the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. It seems that solar events were literally built into the Great Sphinx of Giza and the nearby Great Pyramids. Might this complex have been designed to harness the power of the sun god Ra and other gods who could resurrect the spirit of the pharaoh? Unfortunately, the Great Sphinx was apparently never finished, and Khafre's vision for a cosmic supercenter was never fully realized. There could very well be secret chambers and tunnels yet to be discovered in and around the Great Sphinx of Giza. Ancient Egypt is full of riddles that, today, we still struggle to understand despite our advanced technology. If there is indeed a Hall of Records or something similar buried within the Great Sphinx, explorers have yet to find it. Whatever the case, the Great Sphinx is an ancient monolithic structure that continues to captivate and awe all who gaze upon its massive design. Had this structure been fully developed, who knows how massive it would have been, and how many more secrets it might have held within its chambers and tunnels.